<laughs> so, now it's time for my answer. Whenever anyone asks me, what do you like more that's come from Sweden than Ikea and meatballs? Well, it tends to be the free crown class. Although that answer does tend to get me some very interesting responses from people who basically go, what are you talking about? And I go, well, you need to know. You need to know what you don't know. Tre Krona class, the Free Crown class. They are a very special batch of cruisers because there aren't many nations in the world, 1920s and 30s, which actually can build their own cruisers. Let alone build pretty much everything themselves, either under license or, in the case of Bofors, their own guns, their own armor, everything. And there are even fewer nations which actually do the construction. So there's nations which can do it on paper, and there's nations which actually do do it. Sweden is this nation which does. And they produce a very interesting class. They produce something which... Honestly, no one else had done. I don't... I don't know how to put this. It's one of the interesting things. I like the class. I like the effort they put into it. I like the quality they produce. From it. I'm not sure I agree with the layout, but I do understand their thought process. And I understand why they structure it the way they have, especially when you're considering if you shift weight around in your hull, you make a ship which is slightly better at getting through ice. And I do think that is a factor in their design and construction of these ships. They're really quite cool. And they're really quite different. And they have seven six-inch guns. Seven. They have a triple turret forward and two twins aft. They're distinctive to look at. They have most of their engines and machinery quite far forward. They are a two shafted design. But, you know, four drum boilers as well. Not three drum boilers, four drum boilers. They are pushing the envelope of steam power when everyone else is starting to look beyond steam. They're already starting to think about what comes next. What's going to be the power system, the drive of the future at this point? And the Swedes go, yeah, but we can produce this really, really well. As the fact is also that their guns, they are armed with the Bofors. 152mm or 15.2cm cannon were originally designed for the De Seven Provincial class. But we'll get on to that of the Dutch. So, these vessels displaced 7,500 tons standard, 9,348 tons fully loaded. So, they are well within the treaty limits. They are not a big, big cruiser at all. But still... Seven six inch guns. Length 174 meters beneath the between the perpendiculars, um, 182 meters overall. Gives them quite a protruding bow, an Atlantic bow, and a decent sized stern. Beam 16.45 meters, and a draft of 5.94 meters, which is quite shallow in a way, but. Still fairly deep from what you'd expect for a Swedish vessel operating in the Baltic. Especially if you're thinking about it being something which is key to operating the Baltic. And you also have to think about where they're coming from. Because what the Swedes are really building these cruisers for is they're starting at the beginning of World War II. They've been debating this for a while. And they decided that their current generation of defence ships, coastal defence battleships, are not good enough. What they need are three cruiser-led task forces, one involving the other cruiser I've talked about before, which was a seaplane cruiser. And each of these cruisers would lead a destroyer task group. So each would have a force of around 8 to 12 destroyers with them. 
And these three task groups would be the cornerstone of their maritime defense, along with fortifications and other strong positions built around the coast. And they start off building them. And they keep the building going through World War II, but they don't actually complete them until after World War II. As built, they have seven 152mm 6-inch guns, uh, 24mm guns, and seven 25mm guns, of course, being both as they have both are 40mm and both are 25mm and both are 152mm and yeah. The fact that Bofors is now owned by BAE kind of tells you where the 57mm and the 40mm that currently BAE keeps selling around the world come from. 100,000 shaft horsepower for a top speed of 33 knots, or a range of 4,350 nautical miles at 14 knots. That's cool. That's good for what they're needed to do. 70mm belt, a 30mm deck armour on the upper and main. So they have two strips, 30mm armour. Two decks. Turrets between 50 and 127mm of armour. A conning tower, 20-25mm. I suppose that's splinter protection. Honestly, I'm not sure of that. As you all know from watching my videos, I'm... Mm, I'm not quite sure about the whole idea of having a conning tower, but I can understand at the time that is what they want. They want a conning tower. And so, they have one. In, from 1958, uh, Gotcha Lejeune, the second of the class, is armed with 57mm. They replace some of the 40mm guns. And the 40mm guns replace, well, some of the 40mm guns get replaced by new 40mm guns, and some of the 25mm guns get replaced by 40mm guns. But they still retain the six torpedo tubes. Bofors. They are, in many ways, the secret to why Sweden stays independent. There is a thing that if you want to invade somewhere, you, there are two countries in this world that you do not invade, despite how small and, you know, theoretically their populations are easy to overcome are. One of them is Switzerland, because their population is diehard, filled into mountains, and all of them have guns. They literally all have guns. I, I, I love the Swiss, but they all have guns. And those mountains are a good place to lose troops. And you will find yourself fighting locals who know their roots very well and are armed. And in the end, what do you get? A load of mountains, which aren't really worth anything. It's the people which add the value. And they'll have probably taken a lot of you with them to go. So yeah, not, wor not worthwhile invading. Which is why empires tend to use economic means of coercion to try and bring the Swiss to heel. You take the territory around them, and then you just keep squeezing and squeezing until eventually they acquiesce, or their version of it. The other country is Sweden. <laughs> Sweden is... How do I put this politely? They have a history of producing a lot of guns. And I mean a lot of guns. Between 1914 and 1945, Sweden produced the Automagevir Model 1942 rifle, the Carl Gustav Model 1945 submachine gun. Uh, ooh, about four different types of machine of actual machine gun. Um, the Kolsvergrever Browning Model 1921, the Carl Gustav Model 1942, the Kolsvergrever Carl Gustav Model 1937, the Svensa Automagrega and the Model 1940. Um, they produce anti-tank guns, uh, mountain guns, as they're called, which is probably appropriate if you're fighting in the mountains. And then it comes to naval guns, and they produce the 120 millimeters. 
the 15.2, 152 millimeters, and the 150, well, M12 gun, and the 152 M39 gun, and the 152 M42 gun, which is fitted on these ships. And there's the um, 283 millimeter gun as well, which you can see on this interesting, very class coastal defense ship. Um, built just before World War One, the Swedes basically do not understand the concept of not having guns and large numbers of them. They produce their own fighting uh, fighting vehicles, own tanks, uh, own assault guns, everything. The Swedes are incredibly well armed and incredibly good at producing these weapons. The uh, Bofors 152, which I'll be getting into in a bit, is one of the finest 6-inch guns produced in the interwar years. But of course, they're most famous for the 40mm. And the fact is, the development of that it starts off in 1922, when the Swedish Navy purchases some pound, uh, two, uh, some pom-poms, some two-pounder pom-poms from Vickers. They then approach Bofors, and they say, frankly... This is good, but we want it better. And both of us go, yeah, let's sign a contract. So there is a reason why the um, both of us is slightly better than the pom-pom in various ways. It's because the Swedes took the pom-pom and went, we can make it better. And they just, they just keep working on it. But no, the 152mm, well, it was designed for the Tre Krona and the Dutch, uh, the Seven Provincian class. Pretty much the Seven Provincian, these pretties, were, desire, were the funders for it. It was critical for their development and critical for what they were going to be using it for. And for many years, this gun, and especially on this vessel, which was the Amranti Grau, which was previously, of course, the um, Droita, uh, the Seven Provincial class cruiser, were the largest naval guns still in active service. In fact, they were the largest ones in service prior to the commissioning of USS Zumwalt, with a 155mm gun. So for many years... The largest, uh, the only six-inch guns still in service, the largest naval guns still in service around the world, were Bofors, 152mm Cannon M42s that originally were given to the Dutch. It's designed, finished design in 1942, and that's the version we tend to talk about. Its barrel length was 8.05 meters long. Its shell weighs in at 45 kilograms. It has an elevation in standard of its gun mounts of between minus 10 to plus 60 degrees. Rate of fire, 12 to 15 shots per minute. And a maximum firing range of 26,000 meters or 28,400 yards. It has served with Swedish Navy, the Royal Navy, the Netherlands Navy, the Chilean Navy, and the Peruvian Navy. It served with the Chilean Navy because the Chileans bought the Tre Croner class off the Swedes when they finished using them. 30 of the guns were built. They were pretty darn useful considering, well, in service from 1947 till 2017 means they racked up 70 years of utility. 70 years of service. That's barrel life. That is barrel life. So, this is the Tre Croner. Now, the Swedes had watched their allies be invaded. And when I say allies... There was an interesting relationship between them and Norway. It There wasn't an alliance across the Scandinavian nations. It probably would have been sensible if there had been. 
but it would have meant that the Swedes and Norwegians would probably have been drawn into the Winter War, fighting on Finland's side versus Russia. It would have also meant that the Norwegians would have had, possibly the Danish would have been part of it as well, which could have led to an interesting result with the German invasion. It might have meant, led to Norway being actually alert and on full mobilization when the Germans arrived. But, and it's honestly the only chance they would have had for remaining neutral is if there had been such a defensive alliance. But there wasn't. However, the Swedes were very much awake and watching what was going on. And so, in 1940, even though war was going on, they started looking around and deciding what to do. And they made up their mind pretty quickly that they decided to build three cruisers. Eventually, they go with two and using their seaplane cruiser for the third squadron, but, you know. They start off with free cruisers, is the idea. The political debate lasts until 1943, and it's one of those interesting debates where I have seen some people try and write it off as the factions debating, mostly being the progenitors and, pro uh, and uh, products of outside influences, but actually when I look at the actual debate and I look at the English translations of the debates, it seems to be mostly a very thorough, very in-depth defense debate. And I think the fact that the vessels stay in service till 1964 with Sweden, they come commissioned in 1947, the fact that they are in service for nearly 20 years, for 17 years, uh, is testimony to the quality of that debate. They made up their mind with firm rigour. I would also say that actually having such a long debate when you're considering it's going to be critical to your defence, in the middle of a war when you're surrounded by powers who keep bashing into each other, is one of three things. It's either a complete lack of understanding of the strategic situation, which from the quality of the debate I don't think it is, Two, it's a complete product of hubris. Or three, it's a complete product of security because, you know, you have a lot of very sharp, pointy things and no one really wants to come and mess with you because you are the living embodiment of a porcupine which can actually throw its needles. I'd say it's the latter looking at Sweden at the time. Tore Krona has a bit of an interesting experience. Um, between 47 and 48, her captain is Eric Afklint. Um, between 49 and 51, it's Eric Freiberg. Uh, 54 to, uh, in 1954, it's Harry Bong. In 1954 to 55, it's Magnus Stark. Uh, 1955 to 56, it's Ak Lindemann. And 56 to 57, it's Magnus Hammer. And 57 to 58, it's Anders Nielsen. Which is interesting because quite a lot of these officers end up pretty darn senior. Um, Eric F. Clint ends up as Vice Admiral and Chief of the Coastal Fleet and Commanding Officer of the Naval Command East and Head of Section 2 of Defence. We'll go quickly back there. Harry Bong ends up, well, as a pretty darn senior officer wandering around, in commanding officer of the Gothenburg Squadron and of the Karlsruhe uh, Naval Training Schools. Ak Lindemann ends up as a full admiral and acting chief of naval staff from 1960 to 61 and chief of the navy from 61 to uh, 70. All her senior officers do pretty well. And it shows... It's a bit of kind of self-selecting, because you're not going to pick anyone but your best for your two cruisers, which are your big status capital ships. And so then command of them becomes a tester for higher command. You do well, you're going to go on to high command. You do badly. Sorry. Career's over. Bye-bye. Anyway. Here is the other fun thing, because these ships were not built in series, they were built in parallel. 
Yes, the Swedes had two yards that could build them. Amazing. Swedes had better defense industry in the 1940s, in the middle of World War II, than Britain does today. <clears throat> Sorry. Anyway. In Godfaken, it's a shipbuilding company that's located in Hirsing, uh, Gothenburg. Uh, during the 1930s, it was the world's largest shipyard shipyard by launched gross registered tonnage. It's a very capable yard. It had been founded in 1841 but goes bankrupt in 1989. So it's around for 158 years. And this is built in many ways at its height. And it was found by a Scotsman. Founded by a Scotsman. Yep. Uh, Alexander Keeler. Great name. He founded in 1841. Unfortunately, it goes bankrupt in 1867, but it's reorganized as the Gottborg's uh, Mekiske Werkstatt AB. In 1906, the majority of company stocks are taken over by Hugen Hammer and Sven Alves, and the company is reorganized into Gottborg's Nierwerkstatt, and the shipyard's capacity is increased, and by 1916, the shipyard is renamed AB Gottwerken. During the 1930s, it grew so much, as said, that it became the world's largest by gross register launch by gross register tonnage. By 1950, they built a completely new shipyard at Arundel, which is also at uh, uh, Gothenburg. And um, when that shipyard was completed in uh, when the shipyard was completed in 1963, it was uh, unique because most of the building was done indoors. The old shipyard, the city of Arat, closed down in 1968. It's a very, very cool company to go to for construction. And again, it's the depth of Swedish capability and industrial might that they have two such companies to go to to build their ships. And this is the Gotcha Legion. And this is after she has been upgraded and refitted. Now, these are the two largest ships to ever serve in the Royal Swedish Navy. And she is sold to Chile and becomes the Amarante Le Tor and serves in until 1984. And it's, she's scrapped in Taiwan in 1986. Rather sadly. She was commissioned in December 1947 and taken out of service in 1970. Her motto... Nemo me impune lasset was no one provokes me with impunity. <laughs> Which I rather found. I found rather cool. She has an interesting history. And she provided a lot of service for the Swedish Navy. She provided a lot of presents for them. It's one of the things which is often forgotten about Sweden is that when they, like Norway, have a large merchant fleet going around the world, you need to be occasionally have a presence going around the world to go, hello, we're here. Especially in this period, and when sort of there isn't a global policeman. It's one of those things, we often talk about NATO nations depending upon US for their global presence and their global security. But it's a lot more than that. A global hegemon of maritime power, a global maritime hegemon, is pretty much responsible for everyone in the world who doesn't have that kind of reach. Everyone needs good links with them in order to look after their maritime power. Otherwise, there's no point in you having merchant ships which are flagged as merchant ships. Because if you can't depend upon the hegemon to protect your trade and allow your merchant ships to go through and secure them from pirates, well, you have to do that yourself. If you can't do that yourself and you can't depend on a hedgeman, you can't have uh, hedgeman. You can't have trade. Now, as they always say, you know, God helps best those who help themselves, is the old proverb, and it's very true. But also, 
there is a saying, allies help best and relation friendships work best when it's a bit more of a two-way street. So having these cruisers sailing around the world with their 752mm guns and free turrets was Sweden's way of being a presence, of helping themselves, helping others, and in return earning the help of those others. It's also a nice way of showing off their wares. Nothing shows off bofas and your production of sharp, pointy steel things, as well as having a something turn up which looks like a floating exhibit of them. Well-maintained, highly skilled, very polished crew, very capable, and a beautiful ship which is armed to the teeth. It looks good. It really does. And they, and she was, of course, was built, well, the Gotcha Leon Jean, was built at Exberg Mekinsia Verstad, which is another company based in Gothenburg. It founded in 1850 by Christian Barkman, and named Exberg Metal Urk Takins Guthrie. Which I'm, which I'm probably absolutely mauling because my Swedish is terrible. And please let me take this moment to apologize to my Swedish friend, Anna. I'm sorry. You tried your best. Thank you for all your help. I apologize now. <laughs> it's the easiest way. <laughs> When I next do Portuguese, I have a I have a friend I have to publicly apologize to. Anyway, um, they just kept building themselves up, and they're one of these yards which just keeps growing. In the beginning, eighteen sixty and nineties, the shipyard was the smallest of the three that exist in Gothenburg, and its production was based on passenger ships, steam cutters, towboat, Denmark. Norway, and basically they concentrate on Scandinavia, and ferries for Stockholm's own public transportation system. In 1915, though, they undergo massive developments. It's almost as if, while there's a world war going on, the Swedes go, right, and we're going to make sure there's a lot of investment going on in our construction capability, in case we need to get involved in anything. And this is also linked to a uh, takeover of the corporation stocks by Dan Bronstrom. Who's quite an interesting character in Swedish history. Uh, he was the naval minister from 1914 to 1917. So, uh, yes. Can't think why he was taking over a shipyard. <clears throat> oh, and they keep building. And so by the time it comes to the Second World War they have an unprecedented profitability, repairing war-damaged tonnage and replacing uh, tonnage lost for Swedish and Norwegian shipping companies. This was enhanced by the uh, favourable wartime winterfall taxes introduced during the war. Most of these um, profits were reinvested in shipping and industrial investments of the Bronstrom Group, and this continued to Bronstrom and the Yard becoming one of the country's richest in the 1960s. And this is the yard which builds one of your cruisers. This is the shipyard during 1973. Looks pretty busy. They did have some issues in the 1960s thanks to competition with the Japanese shipbuilding industry. But they had produced already for Sweden a lot of very valuable units. This is the point, though. Sweden has the industry. They are able to build their own guns. They're able to source their own iron ore. They're able to build, make their own steel, make their own armor. They are able to do everything themselves. This is why they are such a dangerous small nation to take on. Because, as said... They're a porcupine which can throw their needles and replace them. <sighs> so. I like 
like these cruisers. I like them for what they represent. I like them for the investment on naval and maritime power that they show and the capabilities they provide Sweden with. I do have to say that I'm not the biggest fan of their gun layout. I can understand it. It's actually it's three guns forward and four aft. Two twin turrets aft and one triple turret forward. Um, they're sort of they they didn't make it completely bad by making it completely R centric, and they didn't try and put a quadruple turret forward, which would have been interesting. I do like some of the earlier designs better, which have two twin turrets forward. I think that might have been sensible. I also think if you're going to build a triple turret design, then going for two triples forward and one triple aft would have probably been more my particular professional uh, professional opinion. But I can understand why they're structured the way they are. I also think it provides a bit of an interesting capability, because with three, tur uh, three guns forward, that means if they're leading their destroyers into attack, they can concentrate and aim their fire quite happily to support those destroyers without turning broadside on. And then if they're covering the destroyers with draw off, they've done their torpedo run, well, they've now got four guns pointing aft and two turrets, so they can engage multiple targets, theoretically. Well, it's two. So, yeah, I can see where the design fits into their operational strategic plan and their tactical doctrine. It's not how I do it, but I can understand how they're doing it. And I can see the logic behind it. They're also very well armed air defense wise. These ships are certainly not going to be something which would be easy for enemy aircraft to engage and deal with at any point. The fact that they are such slow to uh, they are so slow to build because the Swedes keep improving their defenses and keep modifying and, and incorporating the latest war experiences there from their observations into them. Uh, makes them a rather slow build. But there again, if they've been around earlier in the war, one does wonder if some of the other major powers around the Baltic might have felt a need to try and put some pressure on Sweden to either throw their lot in with them or to give them over to them. Because these cruisers would have been incredibly useful for the Germans if they're trying to send out their capital ships, and they would have been pretty darn useful for the Soviets as well. I don't think Eagle would have succeeded. I think all they'd have done is, if they'd been the Germans, they'd have found they suddenly lost control of a large chunk of Norway, because the locals combined with the Swedish uh, uh, deciding to come in would probably seem that most of northern and central Norway falls quickly, no matter what German garrison is there, because, again, Swedes have a lot of firepower and can move in snow very well, thank you very much. And if it had been the Soviets, I think they'd have probably gone, yeah, you can come at us uh, when you finish getting through Finland and Germany. You know, sort of, the case of, do you really want to add us to your problems as well? <sighs> They're a nice design. They're a good gun as well. That's, that 152mm is really good gun. Anyway, that's the Triconocross. And, yeah... It's funny to think we this is the last of August's videos that we have three months more of this schedule, these stuff scheduled, these videos, and then we get into December, which is all going to be the Christmas, the whole Christmas end of year stuff before we start off on next year's ones. And the two topics warring for next year are Forgotten Battles. or naval technologies. That's uh, the themes I'm considering for next year. So this is where today's question is going to come in.
if you'd like it to be forgotten battles. I'd love to hear what battles you feel have been forgotten. And I'd love you to write below why you think they should be covered. Also, please put what month and year they come from so I can hunt them down. Because some forgotten battles are forgotten battles because there are about four other battles which have the same name. And one of those is really famous. And the others just don't get any attention because the other one's really famous. And if it's technologies you prefer, um, what technologies would you like me to cover over next year? Bang. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And have a nice day. Take care.